their um, cameras except for John and I just to save bandwidth. And then at the end of the meeting, I'll, I'll ask you to turn it back on and we can have virtual conversations. But this way, for those who don't have great bandwidth, we can, they can see what everything that's going on. Because some people will get virtually will get spinning arrows on their screen. If they don't have good uh, bandwidth. So with that, let me uh, let's get us started. Let's see. I'm going to switch over to my presentation. Yeah, which means I'm going to take that off. All right. So welcome everyone to the September meeting. My name is Mark Minerich. I'm your president. Uh, glad to have everybody aboard. Looks like we got about 26 or so people. I'm sure we'll have more as the night goes on. People realize, oh, I'm supposed to be at a meeting. Well, let me first thank Dave Pesch and his company, Exputo, for donating the service that we have, the big blue button to the Rochester Academy of Science. And we've been able to use this since uh, April. We had some issues. If you're looking, uh, looking at the screen, you'll see me and uh, our Speaker speaker tonight, John Callis. So welcome, John, from JPL to give us this talk tonight about the uh, robotic surface exploration of Mars. And uh, we'll come up with that in a, in a few minutes. So let me go through our uh, our meeting notes here. Um, but how this will work is uh, if, it, if it gets noisy, I will mute you, I, 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 everyone, but I'll, I'll just mute the hot mics that I see out there. Um, don't be offended. You can always turn yourself back on. There's a microphone button right below the main screen. Uh, if you need to turn yourself on, if it, it'll be a, a slash through it if you're off, but you can turn yourself back on if you'd like. Um, during the uh, during John's talk, if you want to ask questions, just chat me and we can and uh, if it's pertinent at the time, I'll ask John, but uh, we'll, we'll hold questions to the end for John for uh, his presentation. Uh, if you had a headset, that's the best way to talk and to listen. Uh, but if you don't, it's not a big deal. It's fine. You can do it that way. All right. So that was our welcome. Thanks for coming, everyone. Let me go through some of the announcements of what we've got going on. But before I get into that, has anybody done any observing lately that they want to talk about? It's been nice out. I know people have been watching stuff. There's some nice planets out there. Hey, Mark, I have... What a thing I discovered that I should have known just scanning around with binoculars. Kochab, the last star in the Little Dipper, is yes. as orange as Arcturus. Actually, the temperature is a little cooler. You don't really notice wow. the color until you look with binoculars, but it's fantastic. No kidding. Is it because it's so much smaller that we don't realize how, how red it is? Yeah, it's magnitude two, and Arcturus is about minus two or something like that. Yeah, so that's true. Just, who thinks of looking at the stars in the Little Dipper? Right? Just yeah. A neglected area. That's cool. Mark, I wanted to share. So I had a, in the neighborhood here, I had uh, um, four of the neighbors got together. I brought out the telescope, everything all set. This was, I think, Saturday night. And we're all looking in the open sky. And as I set, because there's still a little bit light out, so they had a little camp, a little campfire we set in front of it for a little bit. And all of a sudden, it's okay, let's go take a look. Everybody looked up, and it's thick clouds everywhere. Of course. <laughs> See, the whole thing clouded over. So. As soon as you get everything set up, that's when that happens. Yep. This is Carol. Hey, Carol. Can you hear me? We can so, hear you. Um, I, we, you know, we're all missing Mies. Those of us that are involved in the Mies Observatory tours and missing doing the outreach face-to-face -face that we get to do. I had such a kick a couple of weeks ago. One of my grandsons is, is getting close to Eagle Scout, closing in on his astronomy badge. And so we went out two nights. The first night, it was just constellations and, and um, obvious you know, binoculars objects. And I used my green laser pointer, which hasn't been out all summer. And, uh, and the second night, we got out my telescope and looked at um, Jupiter and Saturn and a couple more um, Messier objects. So it was, a. Um, I needed it. <laughs> yes, that's a nice dose of dark sky there. That's great. This is uh, Dave Bishop. Hey, Dave. One of my neighbors just got a permit to build an observatory in his front yard. Front yard? Front wow. yard. And he's putting up a dome in his front yard, two doors down from me. Wow. And to celebrate, I took him over to my front yard and we watched uh, Jupiter and Saturn for a while. Oh, very cool. Of course, your yards are very big there in Hilton. So, <laughs> well, we're a little further out of town. Yeah, that's true. 
That's true. Oh, that's cool. Andy says, I watched the last second aboard a Delta rocket launch a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty dramatic. It was dramatic. Did anyone catch the occultation of Mars by the moon? Jeff Carr has asked. I saw on uh, the, uh, was it the astronomy picture of the day that it just slid past, after it had passed from the, to the dark side of the moon, through the uh, omelet side. It does look strange late at night as you look into the east after you've seen Mars and, or excuse me, you've seen Saturn and Jupiter, how bright and orange Mars looks as it's rising. It is pretty, almost disturbing what that light is over there as Mars gets brighter and brighter. Cool. All right. Moving on. All right. So we've had uh, three virtual parties so far, and we're, we're averaging about anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 people at these. Uh, we've done a lot of galaxies, nebula, and last time we did some star clusters, we explored the Hercules and Ophiuchus and some of the star clusters there. And then we actually looked straight up to see if we could find a dark nebula. And I think we we captured a little bit of dark nebula, which is not easy to do. Um, certainly with more time, we could do we could do better job with that, but that was fun. Um, I'm still working on trying to get streaming, and I may attempt a streaming session somewhere. I'm, I think I want to do a, a, a planetary session that will record first, and then I'll try a streaming session. Our internet is not very good up at the site, but I was able to stream for four or five minutes without an issue. Uh, on a test, and so we'll try it again, but we're still trying to work on getting better internet access at our site. So right now, the uh, the, the Celestron 14-inch in the Big Dome is, is converted to its F11 mode, its natural mode. It's being collimated. I actually looked through it a couple of weeks, a week or so ago, and uh, it still needs to be, to, be, to be collimated, but we'll do a planetary session Next, where we'll look at Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Maybe if we get lucky, we can get a, a moon transit or a great red spot transit, something like that, some, something cool to happen there. And then in between Saturn and Mars is Uranus and Neptune. And with a scope that big, we should be able to get uh, a decent image of Uranus and Neptune. Certainly, we'll be able to see the color of those planets. So we'll, uh, we'll give a shot at that. And now that I know that there's a comet somewhere in Scorpius, We'll take a look for that, too, because it's kind of on the way of this place that we're looking. If it's real low in Scorpius, we may not catch it, but I'll take a look at where it's at. That would be fun to try to catch a comet uh, during a virtual star party. So stay tuned. I'll send it out to the email list. If you're if you're not on the email list, uh, send me, shoot me a note in the chat, and I'll uh, make sure that you get a notice on uh, when those star parties happen. All right, I want to say a thank you to the, the mowing and not just the mowing crew, but the grounds crew. We've had a lot of people that put in time around the, the, the gardens and the, uh, the, the, the wildflowers and stuff. And I know I may, I've probably forgotten people here, but I want to thank these people. Bob McGovern, who's uh, stepping down from his role after 15 years of running the, uh, the Ferris Center as, uh, as the uh, grounds director, Leo Kellett. Dave Vogel, Nick Lamondola, Roger McDonough, Tim Haywood, John and Marianne Rhodes have been out there working on the library. Chris Pryor and John Schultz have been working in the gardens. I know Mel's been out there once or twice. Peter Bono's mowed. Uh, Mark Dudley and I went out there to do some of the, the tick stuff. Uh, I've mowed once. I know Joel's been out there. Apologies to anyone who's mi I've missed. If I have missed you, let me know. I'll make sure that you get some credit for, uh, for the work you've done there. But it's, it's important as we reach the you're getting near the end of that season that I recognize those people. So thank you so much for what you've done to keep our dark sky site in such great shape. All right. So upcoming events tomorrow, we have an open house. So feel free to stop by between uh, 12 and four. You certainly can stop by earlier if you'd like, but officially between 12 and four, uh, if you want to learn more about the site, how to operate the telescopes, how to open up the buildings, uh, how to use the, the buildings we've got. If you want to set up your scope and you're not sure how to do it, that's a good time to come. 
We're going to use the same protocols for COVID that we use for member observing, and I'll go through those in the next slide. But uh, we do have an open house tomorrow, so if you feel like coming on out, it should be a nice day to, to come out to the uh, Ferris Center to explore the site. And uh, any questions, glad to, uh, to answer them there on what we do and how we do it up there. We have a board of directors meeting. Uh, that's a virtual meeting on Wednesday next week. So if you're interested in coming, the directors will certainly be, will be there from 7 to 9 p.m. If you want to come, shoot me a note and I will send you a link to the meeting. I don't want to leave this. This is not a public meeting, but it's it's for astronomy section only. But it, certainly members can attend. Let me know that you want to attend. And I'll be glad to shoot you a note that the uh, that we're meeting. And Tony, Tony says it's the same time as the RAS meeting, so I guess Tony's not going to make it. So, sorry, Tony. All right, so this is the we're going to have a, another member observing night. This is on Saturday the 19th, so that's the new moon weekend. And uh, these are the same rules that we're going to have for tomorrow. If you come in tomorrow, uh, I need we. To, for COVID protocol, we need to know who's there. If, there, if we happen to have any kind of, of a, a virus transmission, we need to know who for contract tracing is there. So we'll have a sign-in sheet there uh, that you would sign in on arrival so we know that you're there. Uh, if you have an active case of coronavirus or you think you're not feeling well, just don't come. But we will have wipes and hand sanitizer at the sign-in sheet. We'll have them in, in, in the bathrooms. Please ensure there's six feet distance between yourselves. If you're less than six feet apart, you must wear acceptable face coverings. Uh, our building cannot be occupied by more than 50% of the maximum, and the maximum in that building is 60, so that means no more than 30 people inside the building, the, the education building, and four people inside the two larger roll-off buildings if you're going to go inside there and explore. Um, both bathrooms will be clean the day of the event, and they're available for use with the same rules. Um, that we've used before. You just wipe the faucet and handles with the disinfecting wipes that are in there uh, before and after you use them. If you use the toilet, wipe the seat with the same wipes and then dispose of them in the trash can. Don't flush them. Wash your hands. Uh, for observing nights, use, we have red lights available if you don't have your own. Please use those only after dark so we don't lose our, uh, our night vision. And have a good time. I know we've done this a couple of times and everybody, every time we've done it, it's, it's really a relief to get out and be able to see each other and uh, enjoy the, each other's company in, in an astronomical uh, environment for at least a little bit of time. So we just got to be careful about how we do it. So far, so good, as long as we've been observing these rules. So whenever we gather at the Ferris Center, we'll, we'll observe, be observing these rules, whether it's an open house or member observing. I'll just remind you each time we do that what the rules look like. Um, and then coming up in October, our October meeting is on Friday the 2nd. Uh, it'll be also through this virtual uh, blue button session as well. And our speaker, keynote speaker will be Scott J. Kenyon. He's an astrophysicist at the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And the title of his talk is Pluto Strikes Back. So it should be an interesting talk on Pluto. I think I think John's, John's amused. <laughs> We'll see what he has to say about Pluto. And then in October, the open house for October is October 17th, but I'll also announce that when we meet in October. And the same protocols that we'll have for tomorrow's open house as well as uh, observing. All right, with that, I'm going to turn this over to John. Actually, do you have any questions for me before I turn this over to John? All right, John, I'm making you the presenter. So ladies and gentlemen, this is John Callis of the JPL uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's all yours, John. We can go to your, you can load up your presentation and go to town. All right, uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's get a moment here to get my presentation. Let's see, help me out here. What do I need to do to have it show up? I'm seeing yours. All right, so you want to uh, go to the plus sign. Okay. And then go to the upload a presentation, then select your presentation. You're going to put a check mark in the circle. Ah, uh, got it. And then you, here you go. There we are. All right. If I may say one more thing, and then I'll be quiet. If uh, if folks want to take John's picture, use your use your 
use your mouse, click on his picture, drag it to the right or to the left, and then it'll give you a full screen of his presentation. Okay, great. Mark, right. thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be with you. Um, looking at the slideshow you were showing at the beginning of uh, the meeting, uh, I, I um, you guys probably know a lot of this stuff already, and so uh, I'm sure I'm going to be talking to a well-informed crowd. So I look forward to your questions. Um, so I want to talk to you about the surface robotic exploration of Mars. I mean, Mars is a place that is of great interest in ancient times. Um, here is a ground-based telescopic image of the planet Mars, and for um, most of uh, human civilization, this is all we knew about the, the planet. Um, we can see here in this image that Mars has surface features, albedo features. Um, there's a polar cap that you can see here, and that these features and the polar cap would wax and wane with the seasonal cycle because Mars is tilted on its axis 25 degrees, very close to the Earth's 23 and a third degrees. So there are four distinct seasons on Mars, so making it very Earth-like. And of course, this led uh, astronomers like Percival Lowell 100 years ago to postulate about the existence of life on Mars. And I'm sure you all know about the canals, his misinterpretation of the word canali. And uh, some have speculated that his drawings of canals are actually drawings of his own, the blood vessels in his own retina as he was making these telescopic observations. But it wasn't until the dawn of the space program that we got our first close-up look at Mars. And that was in uh, 1965 with a flyby of um, the Mariner 4 spacecraft. Um, but we really didn't start our intense exploration of Mars until the Viking missions in the mid-1970s. And so you can see here in this image, this is a Viking orbiter image, and you can look down at the surface and, you know, it's very obvious you don't see any oceans, you don't see any uh, continents or forests or uh, shopping malls. Um, but what you do see are highly eroded craters, which are suggested that there's some process at work on the, on the planet Mars, you know, making it distinct from the moon where the craters there are very sharp and well-preserved. And you also see a very thin, tenuous atmosphere. Uh, the atmospheric pressure on Mars is only about 1 70th of what it is here on the Earth, and it's 95% carbon dioxide. Actually, one of your slides had the uh, composition of the Martian atmosphere. So, um, you would still need a spacesuit if you were an astronaut uh, working around on the surface of Mars. But uh, the, the Viking missions did land two fixed landers on the surface, each containing three experiments uh, to search for signs of life. Now, I'll mention, this is signs of life as we understood things in the mid-1970s. In fact, the, the experiments were designed really based on our knowledge and understanding from the late 60s. Um, and so it, it's very different today, uh, what we think uh, constitutes life in the, in the range and spectrum of life that could exist. In any case, the, the Viking landers landed and they had a soil sample arm. They took samples, they put them into the three different experiments and they tried to see if they could make something grow. And there was no conclusive evidence of life on Mars. I say no conclusive evidence because there's still some controversial results, um, mainly um, doing to with uh, the possibility of uh, perchlorates uh, on Mars, giving a, a false signal. Um, but it's still debated uh, today, um, you know, almost uh, 45 years uh, later. Um, but Viking kind of threw a wet blanket on the exploration of Mars. Because we were so focused on searching for life and life as we understood it at the time, um, that we kind of lost interest. Uh, we kind of, you know, spent our nickel and uh, decided to, to look elsewhere. So it wasn't until the mid-1990s that we returned to the planet Mars. And uh, that was first with the Mars Pathfinder mission, which landed on uh, July 4th, 1997. Now, Pathfinder was not a scientific mission. It was a technology demonstration mission. It was to test out a series of different technologies. One was entry, descent, and landing. You know, how do you land safely on the surface of Mars? Because landing on Mars is harder than uh, landing on the Earth or returning to the Earth, and it's harder than landing on the moon. Um, but the airbag system that Pathfinder incorporated uh, was very successful and was used later by Spirit and Opportunity. The other technology, which is obvious in this picture, is a freely roving uh, robotic vehicle, Sojourner. Now, Sojourner was only about the size of a microwave oven uh, or a laser printer, pick your analogy. 
Um, and when it comes to rovers, size does matter because the bigger the rover, the bigger the wheels, the more obstacles you can traverse and the farther you can go. Sojourner was dependent on the lander for telecommunications to Earth. So it couldn't go any farther than you see in this picture about you know, 10 or 12 meters from the landing site. So we could only really explore the area right around the lander. And we were frustrated because we saw all these really exciting things off in the distance, like that big, large rock that you see here just at the edge, or what's on the other side of that ridge. Um, but it demonstrated the great success that you can have with a roving vehicle. Now, with Pathfinder's success on the surface, there was another mission that went into orbit around Mars, and uh, that was um, Mars Global Surveyor. And as its name implies, it was meant to do a global survey of the planet Mars. And we kind of learned our lesson with Viking. Viking was very well focused, narrowly focused, some would say, where Global Surveyor is taking a very broad perspective at Mars. So let's look at the context of the planet as a whole. Now, what you see in this uh, set of data here is altimetry for Mars. We have a laser altimeter on the spacecraft, and we measure the altimetry to great precision over the entire surface of the planet. So red and white correspond to high elevations. You can see the Tharsis volcanoes, Olympus Mons, and then blue and purple are very low elevations. You can see Hellas Basin over here. But what's striking in this uh, set of data is you notice that the northern hemisphere of Mars is not only very low, it's also very smooth. It's one of the smoothest surfaces um, in the solar system. The only surface that is smoother than this is the surface of the ocean here on the Earth. And if you look carefully, you'll see these great channels that are very suggestive of fluid flow channels, maybe great rivers at one time, that fed a putative great northern ocean. Now, this is controversial, it's debated, um, but there is a, a body of evidence that suggests that maybe Mars had a great northern ocean at one time. Um, this image here is from the, the uh, Mars Orbiter camera, the mock camera on Global Surveyor. Um, the field of view here is about three kilometers or across the width of it, uh, has a resolution of about one and a half meters. And you see this uh, canyon system that was carved by water. Uh, the geologists know this by the topography and geology um, and, you know, the slopes involved. Um, and you'll notice this very thin channel down the middle of it. And this tells the geologic community that this was carved by slowly flowing water. Not a great flood, uh, not something where an impact crater quickly melted subsurface ice that welled up to the surface, flowed for hours, days, or weeks, and then uh, dissipated or sublimated. Um, but this is evidence of sustained liquid water on the surface. Well, we've got a problem because today the atmospheric pressure on Mars is so low, um, it's actually right around the triple point of water. Uh, for much of this uh, its season, it's below the triple point of water. So water can't exist as a liquid on the surface, at least not for any sustained period of time. So it's either an ice or it's a vapor. Um, so we have this conundrum. Well, how could you have sustained liquid water on the surface? Well, what you need is a thicker atmosphere. And so this is uh, uh, suggestive that Mars at one time had a thicker atmosphere. And not only a thicker atmosphere, but warmer temperatures because the water was liquid. It wasn't frozen as ice. So um, this is a, a compelling set of questions about did Mars have a thicker atmosphere? What happened to it? Uh, when did it have that thicker atmosphere? What were the conditions like? How long was water sustained on the surface? Uh, these are all really powerful questions that gets to the question of habitability on Mars. And those are the questions that we wanted to answer. And so we felt the best way to approach those questions is to go back down onto the surface of Mars, but this time with a much more capable vehicle. And this is the Mars Exploration Rover. So we built two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. They were launched in 2003 and they arrived at Mars in January of 2004. So you can see in this image, this is much larger than Sojourner. I mean, this is about uh, 10 times the mass of Sojourner. Um, these rovers weighed uh, 180 kilograms. Uh, the wheels are larger. They're 25 centimeter diameter wheels. You can see the people working around them. So, you know, they're normal size people. So you get an idea that this is kind of about the size of a riding lawn tractor or, or a golf cart. Um, you know, it has a white mast that supports a set of cameras, and notice the cameras are just at eye level, 
So the images it takes will have very much a human perspective. They're arranged as stereo pairs. You have left and right cameras. So we have two camera systems on the top, but we have a navigation system and we have a set of science cameras. And even in front of the rover, it's hard to see, but down in front, we have another pair of cameras. These are the hazard avoidance cameras. These have fisheye optics, so they have about 180 degree field of view. We have another pair of cameras in the back. So we're, so we were camera rich uh, by standards of the day. Um, and we also have a thermal emission spectrometer that sits in the belly of the rover and it looks up through the periscope or the four optics of this mast. The other important difference about this rover is it's completely independent. It's not dependent on any surface asset like Pathfinder or Sojourner was. So it can freely rove on the surface of Mars. It's solar powered, it carries its communication system. It has two separate systems, an X-band system for direct communication to Earth and a UHF system, which was experimental at the time for communicating with orbiting assets. We had Mars Global Surveyor in orbit and then Mars Odyssey uh, that could provide relay support for the rover on the surface. Uh, in addition, we had uh, a robotic arm on the front of the rover, about the size of your own arm. So two uh, joints at the shoulder, an elbow, and then two joints at the wrist. And then there are four devices on the end of this arm. So one of them, as you see here, is called the rock abrasion tool or the rat. And it is meant to grind into rocks. This is the uh, analogy of the geologist rock hammer. Because what do geologists do? They go out into the field, they hike around, they look around with their their stereo vision, they find targets of interest, they go up to it, they take out the rock hammer and they open their beer. I, I'm sorry, no, they, op they crack open the rocks and they look inside because the clues are in the rocks. Uh, and so that's what we want to do on Mars. In addition, usually the next thing that a geologist does is they pull out their little ham lens and then they look inside the rocks. They look at the crystals, the colors, the morphology. And we have a little microscope right here. We call it the, the uh, microscopic imager. And then we have two contact spectrometers, an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, which will give us the light element analysis, pretty much everything from um, like sodium up through um, titanium on the, um, actually higher up, up through iron on the periodic table. And then we have a MOS power spectrometer that will determine the oxidation state of iron bearing minerals, uh, Fe2 versus Fe3. Uh, and that's important because Mars, the red planet, is due to a lot of uh, iron oxides on the surface. And so that will be very telling about the origin of some of these minerals on the surface. So taken together, what we have is a robotic field geologist. And so what we are, what we did on Mars is classic field geology. So we got to get to Mars. So the first thing you do is you fold up your rover like a uh, transformer. Um, you know, the mass stow, the solar rays fold up, the wheels tuck in, you put it on your lander, you fold up your lander into a tetrahedron with a set of airbags on each of the four surfaces. You put that inside an aeroshell, um, and then you launch it to Mars. And we had two separate launches, so Spirit launch first, and then uh, Opportunity from the Kennedy Space Center. And then uh, seven months later, we arrive at Mars. And um, so the question is, obviously, where are we gonna go on Mars? Well, here are the uh, two locations, Spirit on the left and uh, Opportunity on the right. On the left, we're headed to Gusev Crater. This is a crater that's about 100 miles in diameter, so pretty much you could fit all of Los Angeles into this basin. You notice it has a great flow channel here, remnants of an ancient delta, and you can even see where the flow breached out here and water flowed to the north. The red ellipse is our landing ellipse. Um, you know, in order to do exploration, you have to get there safely. So we wanted a nice, flat, smooth area to touch down. Uh, this crater provided a, a great uh, landing location. But because we had visual evidence that this was at one time a flooded crater. So we were excited about the prospects of looking at lake bed sediments. Opportunity landed completely on the other side of the planet, 12 Martian time zones away place we call Meridiana Planum. It's also a nice flat, smooth area. But you'll notice in this picture, it's color coded. Uh, this is a mineral map provided by Mars Global Surveyor uh, of the mineral hematite. Hematite is an iron oxide that forms in an aqueous environment. Uh, and this is the only place on the surface of Mars that we see abundance of hematite on the surface. So this is um, chemical evidence of water. So Gusev Crater, 
we have visual evidence of water. Meridiani, we have chemical evidence of water. So two different scientific hypotheses, two identical rovers to explore these two hypotheses on the surface of Mars. So here we are, January 2004. We go through entry, descent, and landing. So we hit the atmosphere going at about uh, 12,000 miles an hour. Um, we use an ablative heat shield that becomes incandescent. And so it's ablating away, keeping our rover inside uh, safe and comfortable. Uh, after only about a minute, we go from 12,000 miles an hour to about Mach 1. Uh, and then we deploy a parachute. Uh, we drift down on the parachute. Uh, we inflate the airbags around the rover, making it into a gigantic beach ball. And as we approach the ground, a laser altimeter senses when we're about 50 meters above, it fires a set of retro rockets, which just stalls our descent momentarily. We cut the bridle, and then this giant beach ball with a half billion dollar rover inside bounces down and rolls around on the surface of Mars. It comes to a stop, the airbags deflate, that lander opens like the petals of a flower, so it's self-riding if we didn't happen to land upright, revealing the rover. The rover deploys its solar panels because we're on battery power during uh, end, uh, descent and landing. Um, and then days later, we deploy the mast, we stand up on our wheels, and then we rove off onto the surface of Mars. And so here is the, the first color image taken on the surface of Mars by Spirit. Uh, the rover is actually still on the lander. You can see the airbags here in the foreground. Um, now these rovers were designed with a traverse capability of about a kilometer and a mission lifetime of about 90 Martian days, 90 sols. A Martian day is only about um, 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. And so you might be saying, well, why 90 days and a kilometer? Well, Sojourner was designed for only seven days of operation and its uh, traverse capability was only about 80 meters. And so we were an order of magnitude improvement over the previous generation of technology. So we thought, oh, this is great. Uh, so we had you know, three months to explore the region around the landing site. And the geologists were really excited because here they could see lots of rocks distributed around and every one of these has a story to tell and the geologists wanted to learn that story. Now you'll see in the distance a set of hills we named those the Columbia Hills after the uh, Columbia astronauts that lost their life um, before, just before we launched the, the mission. And those are about two and a half kilometers away. So we, at the time we dreamt of the future when another mission might be able to explore those hills. But in any case, we had work to do, so we went uh, right to work. So here we're driving off the lander. This is an image with our hazard avoidance cameras. Um, so you can see the lander and our wheel tracks and um, we started sampling the rocks. And here you can see the robotic arm on the left grinding in this, to this rock we call Adirondack. And we went to measure its chemistry and its geology, and it turned out to be basaltic, a piece of lava. Well, this is surprising because we were in Gusev Crater, and we were expecting to find lake bed sediments, and yet we found a piece of lava. In fact, all the rocks we examined in this area were all basaltic. So Mars threw us a curveball. It's like, what's going on here? Why do we have all this volcanic evidence and nothing about lake bed sediments, even though we have this compelling visual evidence about lake bed sediments? Well, uh, Opportunity landed just uh, three weeks after uh, Spirit. And you can see here, Opportunity's landing site was kind of a hole in one. This is a small crater. We named it Eagle Crater. It's only about 20 meters in diameter. And you can see the lander. And you can see all the rover wheel tracks. And notice along this edge, exposed bedrock. This was an aha moment because here we had a chance to examine the native geology of Mars for the very first time. And so we drove up to it. You can see the uh, rover wheel tracks. Uh, no, that's not a boot print. Uh, it is the <laughs> rover wheel tracks. And you can look at these rocks and notice the fine laminations, these small horizontal lines appearing in all the rocks. These are rocks formed in an aqueous environment. Now, rocks don't form overnight, so this meant that this aqueous environment had to have persisted for geologic timescales, 10,000 years, 10 million years, very long uh, periods of time. Um, and you can see places where we ground into the geology with our uh, rock abrasion tool and sample it, and we found the evidence of gerasite and other minerals, which are conclusive evidence of an aqueous environment.
So we now have established that Mars did have sustained liquid water on its surface for you know extended periods of time. So what happened? Where did the water go? You know, how long was it there? Uh, obviously, it was there for an extended period of time, but can we quantify that better? Um, right now, our best evidence is that it formed, it, that conditions existed about three and a half to four billion years ago. Well, if you look at the Earth's history, three and a half to four billion years ago, that's when life emerged. So Mars likely had a thicker atmosphere, had liquid water on its surface, warmer temperatures, a more Earth-like environment, and life starts on the Earth, but not Mars. Um, and we also know that even if life didn't originate on Mars, the two planets have exchanged material. I mean, some of you might have samples of Martian meteorites. Well, the fact that we have Martian meteorites here on Earth means there are Earth meteorites on Mars. And uh, scientists have made estimates of the uh, you know, thousands of tons of Earth material that's on the surface of Mars. And some of that material or is likely in chunks that are large enough that if there were microbes, they could have survived the radiation environment in the uh, multi-million year transit from Earth to the surface of Mars. So these are all great compelling questions, but where are the answers? So um, we found that after 90 days, the rovers were still going. So why did the rovers last only 90 days? Uh, were they designed for only 90 days? Well, the experience with Pathfinder is you get about 1% dust obscuration per day uh, from airfall dust on the solar arrays. And the, in Pathfinder's case, it was thought that the dust is clinging electrostatically. So we think you lose a percent a day, you know, you take, you know, 0.99, raise that to the 90th power, you get a number like 0.7. And so at some point we would not be generating enough energy to keep the rovers warm and safe and operable on the surface of Mars. And that was thought to be 90 days. Well, turns out things um, weren't as bad as that. The airfall dust wasn't as bad. Temperatures were warmer than we thought. Uh, the solar rays performed better than we uh, had uh, nominally designed. And wind would come along and blow the dust off. And so this gave us a new lease on life and, you know, the great thing about a roving vehicle is with each passing day, you know, the fact that you rove to a new location, it's like a brand new mission. And so you see here in this image, a crater. This is Endurance Crater. It's about 150 meters in diameter. And the geologists wanted to go down inside. Why? Because, well, that's what geologists do. Um, it's a hole in the ground. The geology down at the bottom is older than the geology at the top. You know, just like you go to the Grand Canyon and you look at the magnificent stratification you see in the walls of the Grand Canyon, you know that the layers down below are older than the layers up at the top. So if you get to go down, you get to go back in time. But we never designed these rovers to um, go down into a crater. Um, and we didn't want it to be a suicide mission. So, you know, what did we do? Well, um, well, like any, you know, good engineer, uh, we went to our local home center and we bought a whole bunch of plywood and uh, construction lumber and uh, those paving stones that your spouse wants you to use to build the deck out in the, the backyard. And we built a giant tilt table, covered it with sand and rocks, used a crane to lift it up on one side to be able to set different slopes. And we took our test rover, which we ballasted to Mars weight because the Martian gravity is only about three eighths what it is on Earth. And we demonstrated not only that we could go down safely, but that we could come back out again. And so with that confidence, we went down inside. Now, this is a false color image. We, our color cameras have uh, a total of 13 different filters. Um, so it's a composite image. So we, Mars does not have a blue sky, but we used it to bring out the subtleties and the different geologic units. And so you can see here the rover wheel tracks as we went down in. And then you can also see all the places where we grounded and measured the geology uh, in all these different units. And look at the variety of units, different colors, different textures, different morphologies. And so we were able to do what the uh, geologic community calls it in sequence stratigraphic section, meaning we were reading the chapters of the Martian history book in reverse order as we went down inside. And this confirmed our hypothesis from our earlier uh, uh, determinations of ancient Mars did support sustained liquid water uh, somewhere around three and a half to four billion years ago. But rovers can drive and they 
solar arrays are still producing energy. And so we did drive and we drove kilometers on the surface of Mars, uh, well beyond the 90 day mission. And uh, as we drove, we found evidence of water along the way. Now, when I showed you that image from Spirit in the Columbia Hills, two and a half kilometers away, well, we drove to those hills and we got there. And this is on the Columbia Hills. And we're already started the ascent of the Columbia Hills. And this outcrop you see here that we drove up to and explored is significant because when we measured the chemistry, we found that it's about 30% weight carbonate minerals. And this is a big deal because we were looking for carbonates. Why? Well, um, if you remember back in your early elementary school days, all the classrooms you were in had chalkboards. Now they're all whiteboards or smart boards. Um, but the calcium carbonate chalk that you used in that classroom is part of the ancient atmosphere of the Earth. The Earth had a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. It had a neutral pH ocean that CO2 dissolved in that ocean, precipitating out as carbonates. Uh, that eventually some mining company came along billions of years later to extract the mine to make the chalk that they used in the classrooms. So is this an explanation for what happened to Mars? Did Mars have a great northern ocean that was neutral pH and that its CO2 atmosphere dissolved in that ocean, sequestering carbonates in the surface? And is this evidence of that? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's not conclusive but it adds to this great story about Mars and that it is very much a changed planet over time. Um, so we continue to explore. And so now this image, I, I've jumped ahead. I'm now about two years into the mission, well beyond the three month original prime mission. So this is great. You know, we're, we're, we're fantastically expanding our exploration of Mars. And this is where we have the first sort of failure uh, on either vehicle. Now, you know, the rovers were designed for a kilometer. Uh, that is based on the fact that our six driving wheels use brushed motors, uh, and then they have a 1500 to one gear reduction box. So the rovers don't move very fast, about as fast as a tortoise, but they generate a lot of torque. Our rovers generate as much torque as a Hummer H2. Uh, I always wanted to do a tractor pull between our rover and a Hummer, but no one would allow me to do it before we launched. Um, but here, I wanted to show you, if you look sort of the um, middle upper part of the image where my cursor is, you can see two distinct rover tracks. You'll see some light tone material here. And then as we come down here to where the rover is, you'll see there's some very different, uh, it's very different between the two rovers wheel track. This one is uh, sort of as expected. Notice this one has a furrow. What happened over here is the right front wheel of the rover failed. We're not quite sure binding might have broken or one of the brushes may have cracked uh, on the uh, motor. And so with a 15 to one reduction, you can't back drive that uh, wheel. It's like one of those annoying grocery store carts. The wheel is jammed and you're trying to push it down the aisle way and it's yawing significantly. Well, we still had five operable wheels. So we were able to drive the rover backwards and we're dragging that one wheel. And as we drag it, it turns up the soil. But that failure actually turned out to be perhaps the biggest scientific discovery of the mission because it churned up this light tone material you see here. And this light tone material is amorphous silica. It's opaline silica. So this is a mineral that forms in an aqueous environment that has an energy source. So this is a big deal because this is evidence of hydrothermal systems on Mars. So let's sort of uh, summarize the, the discoveries we have today. We have evidence that there was sustained liquid water on Mars. We have um, circumstantial evidence that there were warmer temperatures on Mars and a thicker atmosphere. And now we have a source of energy. So now we have uh, more of the physical habitability requirements for life. You know, anywhere we look on Earth where we have water and a source of energy, we find a thriving ecosystems. Uh, think, for example, the geysers of Yellowstone National Park. Those geysers are surrounded by thick stromatolite mats of biomes, living systems that are thriving, not from solar energy, but thermal energy coming from that hot aqueous environment. Well, that's the kind of physical environment that we have here on Mars at some time in the past. So again, was there life on Mars? Is there life there today? Can we find evidence of it? 
Well, those are very, very big questions that we won't be able to answer conclusively with these rovers because we don't have the necessary life detection equipment. But we are establishing the physical habitability at some point in the past of Martian history, or maybe even physical habitability today in certain environments, maybe subsurface environments on Mars. Well, we eventually had to say goodbye to Spear because because of its failed wheel, it became embedded in what was a, a invisible or hidden uh, trap for the rover. We broke through some crusty material. We got uh, stuck in this light tone material you can see churned up here. And after more than a year of trying to extricate the rover, we were unable to. We were unable to position the rover favorably for the winter because dust had been building up successfully on the solar rays. It didn't get completely blown off by the wind, at least in the case for Spirit. And so each winter we had to park the rover on a tilt to maximize the illumination from the sun to generate electricity. We couldn't do that this winter. We didn't generate enough energy. The rover fell silent and it never woke again. And we eventually had to say goodbye. But Opportunity kept driving. And this map shows uh, what Opportunity has been able to do on the surface of Mars. So here's where we landed in Eagle Crater. We drove. Um, you know, of the order of uh, hundreds of meters to get to Endurance Crater. We then drove kilometers to Victoria Crater and then tens of kilometers down to Endeavor Crater. Now, why Endeavor Crater? Why did we want to go this far? Well, it was, it was something to check out on the surface of Mars. We were running out of nearby targets. Um, but notice that it is a highly eroded crater. Um, and that means it's, it's ancient. It dates back to the Noachian era on the surface of Mars. Noachian era is the period of Mars in which Mars was warm and wet, the, the time most likely to have been conducive to life on Mars. So we wanted to go back in time. And that's what we did by driving to get to Mars. You'll notice this um, label down here, Marathon Valley. We labeled that valley Marathon Valley because uh, we had to drive a marathon's distance on the surface of Mars to get there. And this is uh, significant from a, a human perspective in that this is the first time that any human enterprise has gone a marathon's distance on the surface of another world. And so we were excited to, to be able to make that, uh, that history. And so here we are at the rim of uh, um, Endeavor Crater. We've climbed up it. You can see the rover wheel tracks that pretty much disappear to the horizon. Um, we got to the, the summit, and you'll see in this picture, we, we raised the robotic arm up in the air. We see that we have a flag on the uh, robotic arm. And, and that's uh, significant because today is September 11th, and we all remember the great tragedy that befell this nation back in 2001. The company that produced the rock abrasion tool for this mission is called Honeybee Robotics. And they were based in Manhattan at the time of September 11th in 2001. And their team, you know, witnessed the, the horror and the tragedy of that day. And so um, after that event, that, that terrific day, they approached the city of New York and they asked if they could recover some material from the uh, World Trade Center site. They specifically requested a piece of aluminum. And they did, they received it, and they refashioned that aluminum, and they integrated that piece of aluminum into the rock abrasion tool. So this aluminum face shield came from the World Trade Center site. And it is a testament of, of human spirit in the face of adversity that, you know, we, we chose to rise above and to do something really phenomenal uh, like exploring the surface of Mars uh, in spite of the, the tragedies that had befallen us. So we continue our exploration and uh, we got to this area called uh, Perseverance, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, Perseverance Valley. And uh, orbital evidence had suggested that this valley was, uh, uh, showed the kind of morphology that would suggest that it was carved by flowing water. So we wanted to understand the hypothesis of how what carved this particular valley. Was it flowing water? Were it dry flows? Was it a combination of things? And so 
you know, at this point, I, I've kind of sped ahead. We're now 14 years on the surface of Mars with opportunity. Uh, and we were exploring these hypotheses when the worst uh, global dust storm uh, hit the planet Mars in recorded history. And we went from a normal day, and what you see here is these are successive images of the sun taken by our cameras. We, we take daily images of the sun to measure atmospheric opacity. And this is the sun on a typical, moderately dusty Martian day. And these are subsequent days. And you'll notice that the sun is completely extinguished and that Mars became, uh, it became night during the day on Mars. And without sunlight, we didn't have energy to power the rover. The rover went to sleep. Um, and we listened, and we listened for over eight months to see if the rover would ever wake up again. Uh, and unfortunately, it never did. And eventually, we had to say goodbye to opportunity. But it was a phenomenal mission, accomplishing far beyond anything people expected. You know, we established the physical habitability of Mars, confirmed that we sustained liquid water, sources of hydrothermal energy, uh, carbonates. Um, and so it enriched greatly our understanding of the red planet. But that's not the end of the story. It's only the beginning of the surface exploration because while we were operating on the surface of Spirit and Opportunity, the next rover mission arrived, and this was Curiosity, Curiosity the Mars Science Laboratory, landing in 2012. Curiosity is a much bigger rover, as you can see in this image. Um, it's uh, five times the mass of Spirit and Opportunity, carries uh, more than 10 times the instrumentation, and it's nuclear powered. So it is. Um, doesn't have to depend on the sun and isn't affected by dust the way spirit and opportunity uh, were affected. It too has a large robotic arm. It has a drilling system so it can take powdered samples and introduce that into experiments inside the rover. One of them is a mass spectrometer which can identify all the elements and the isotopes from hydrogen all the way up through uh, beyond uh, the periodic table. In fact, over 400 Daltons in capability. So this means that Curiosity is now the analytic chemist for Mars, where Spirit and Opportunity were the field geologists for Mars, Curiosity is the chemist for Mars. And so now we can uh, examine the next piece in the question of life on Mars. Are there the presence of organics on Mars? Um, but this rover is a much bigger rover. It cannot use airbags because it's so massive. And so we use the sky crane or what I sometimes refer to as a rover jet pack. And so this fits over the top of the rover. It flies it near the surface and then it will lower the rover down safely onto the surface of Mars. So um, where are we going to go with this rover on Mars? Well, we go to Gale Crater. So here's a, a uh, projected image of Gale Crater. Uh, it's about the size of Gusev Crater, um, and it's a little hard to see in this resolution, but there's a slight little uh, uh, blue oval right here. This is where uh, Curiosity landed. There's evidence that there are ponded lake bed materials here. Uh, again, if you could look carefully, you could see some flow channels here. So perhaps there are evidence of aqueous minerals here. We also have Mount Sharp, this mountain central peak uh, that the rover is climbing up, which has the stratigraphic history of Mars um, entombed inside. And we hope that uh, Curiosity will be able to explore all that. Um, so here's a artist rendering of how we use the sky crate to land on the surface of Mars. Again, the jetpack brings us close and lowers us down on the surface. And then this uh, jetpack flies away and, and crashes. Um, so here is um, landing day on Mars uh, at Times Square in New York. They had all the landing events up on the big jumbotron. It was very exciting. Uh, I was uh, at Caltech. We had a huge set of jumbotrons there. Uh, it was a worldwide experience. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And we landed successfully. And we began the next phase of exploration of Mars with Curiosity. And Curiosity is also very camera rich. It has a much more capable set of color cameras. Here it has a color camera on the end of the robotic arm, and so it's taking a selfie. And what you'll see here in the foreground 
is that the uh, robotic arm has already taken samples and introduced them into the experiments within the rover. And we have uh, determined the presence of organics on Mars. So we do know that there are organic molecules. Of course, we know there's carbon dioxide. That's an inorganic form of carbon. But we now know there are organic forms. And we also know that there is nitrogen on Mars, we knew in the atmosphere. So we have the chemical pieces to form building blocks of biological systems. So was there life on Mars? Is there life there today? Can we find evidence of it? That really is going to take uh, future missions to answer that question. But we've added the next piece of exploration of Mars and Curiosity continues to explore Mars today, sort of handing off from spirit and opportunity, so continuing the sustained exploration of Mars that began in January 2004. Um, but our exploration continues. So um, here's just a bit, um, drill holes uh, on the surface of Mars by from Curiosity, taking those samples. Um, but we are now on our way with the next rover mission to Mars, Mars 2020. It's also a rover about the size of Curiosity, so a very large vehicle. Uh, it has redesigned wheels. Some of you may know the wheel story with Curiosity. Um, and it carries uh, a different set of instrumentation, but again, a very capable robotic arm. But this robotic arm is capable of taking core samples, samples about the size of a piece of chalk, um, and sequestering those samples for future robotic sample return. Again, camera rich with lots of instrumentation. Here you can see a picture of it uh, going through uh, final integration testing at JPL. Um, and one of the exciting things about this mission is it's carrying a technology demonstration. And that is the Mars helicopter named Ingenuity. Uh, it is a um, dual counter rotating rotor system here. It's solar powered. You can see the little solar array on top. It'll be carried under the rover. And this will not only test those technologies, but provide aerial reconnaissance that will enhance the exploration capabilities of uh, 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 Perseverance, the rover, once it arrives. You can see here um, the, uh, the helicopter folded and affixed to the underside of the, the rover. Um, and here is where we're going, uh, Jezero Crater on Mars. And this is a zoomed in image that has been color coded for its mineral types. And you can see this dramatic inflow channel in this ancient Delta system. It's a very exciting location to go. The rover is going to touch down in the smooth area over here and then explore this. And these uh, minerals are all relevant to their bio potential, aqueous in, in, in nature. And so we're very excited about the possibility of collecting samples here that we'll eventually bring back to Earth. Um, but, you know, we launched uh, yeah, Perseverance this summer in the midst of the pandemic. And so as sort of a way to acknowledge the challenge that we face, we made a special emblem and that signified here. And we couldn't do what we did uh, launching this rover on time without the great contribution from all those people on the front line, the healthcare professionals, the first responders, the delivery people, the grocery store clerks, that all contributed to us and to be able to continue our work and do it safely. And so that's indicated here by the uh, symbol for the medical community, the snake on the staff, and it's supporting the earth because in fact, that's what they're doing. They're supporting all of us. And you can see here the trajectory that, Curie, uh, that Perseverance has taken as it departs Earth on its way to Mars. And this emblem is mounted on the side of the rover, and you can see it here on the left side of the rover. So this is the front. You can see the encapsulated uh, helicopter here, Ingenuity, and then you can see the emblem here. And we were able to integrate everything at the Kennedy Space Center, put the uh, rover inside its uh, launch configuration and its fairing. And we had a magnificent launch at the end of July and it's safely on its way to Mars. And it arrives on February 18th. So stay tuned for that date for a dramatic landing on Mars. And then it will begin its um, multi-year mission to explore Jezero Crater and to uh, intelligently identify and select samples 
that will be cached for eventual sample return. So the rover's not bringing in samples back. It will collect uh, a few dozen samples. It will store them either on the rover or on the surface. And then a future mission, which is in planning right now, will go to retrieve them. Now, you might be saying, well, why are we waiting on the next phase of the mission? We want to make sure that Perseverance arrives safely, successfully caches its samples, before we make the great commitment about sending the next phase of the mission to Mars. And that will be a lander with a small fetch rover and a launch vehicle to collect up the samples, have the fetch rover install those samples into the launch vehicle, and we land, then we launch those samples into Martian orbit. And then the third phase, once we know those samples are safely in orbit around Mars, is a uh, orbiting spacecraft that will depart Earth, will go into orbit around Mars, rendezvous with those samples, collect the samples, you know, do an, you know, Mars orbit rendezvous, and then deorbit Mars, bring the samples back to Earth, and have a ballistic trajectory to put those samples back down on the ground of the planet Earth, such that we can then bring to bear all the instrumentation, in fact, instrumentation that is yet to be developed to be able to examine these samples and to answer the question whether there is life on Mars um, and find out whether we share our solar system with or have shared our solar system with other forms of life. So this is a big step forward, a very exciting set of questions for us uh, to investigate. And yet we are continuing the sustained surface robotic exploration of Mars, which we expect to continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Of course, all of this is really to you know understand more about our own planet and our own uh, origins, where we came from, where we're going, and what might happen to us. Mars is a planet that could serve as a proxy for what my, the future might hold for our planet. You know, we're examining and we're dealing with challenges of climate change and global warming. Understanding what might have happened on Mars can help us to inform us here on Earth to be good stewards of our own planet. So I will end there. You can find all these images at the JPL website. Yeah, yeah, I welcome you to check it out and to follow along on our current missions and our future missions. And I hope that you will stay interested in this great exploration adventure on Mars. So I will stop there and I'd be pleased to take any questions you might have. An awesome talk, John. I, a lot of, uh, you really tied together for us why each mission uh, will succeed at the previous one and what we learned from each going to where we are today. So I, I don't think I don't think a lot of us understood what was going on from one mission to the next. So it really does tie things together. Mm -hmm. Let's see, some people might be typing in questions here. All right. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question you want to ask. It's a quiet crowd tonight. And John, that was excellent. Um, of course, Thank I you. I see the I see the sunlight coming through your window, and of course, it's dark here, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's actually very attenuated sunlight. Um, I'm about 10 miles away from one of those Southern California fires. And oh. The air is very thick with smoke and the, the sun is just an orange ball. So uh, yeah, I feel like I'm on Mars. Yeah, I have family in Fremont and I that's, I see the same thing from their FaceTime you know, movies and videos. Um, so no, that was excellent. I definitely learned a lot about the different uh, pieces and I've had most of the models. So now it kind of makes sense for where you're at and where you're going. So when do they think this uh, this return rocket's going to bring back material from the planet if it all goes well? Probably of the order of ten years. You know, as I'm sure some of you know that um, there's a favorable launch opportunity to Mars from the Earth about every 26 months. So um, that kind of sets the cadence. So you know, once we land with uh, Perseverance, it's going to take a couple of years, um, you know, to collect those samples. So we probably won't launch um, anything to Mars 
you know, um, at least a couple of years after land. I suspect it'll be more like four years because, because you know, NASA is not likely to make the commitment to the resources to build the next set of equipment uh, to do the sample uh, collection until we have confidence that we have a target to uh, to uh, rendezvous it, it, and collect. So, um, so probably that net mission is four or six years from now. Um, and again, then you have to wait uh, to confirm that you've successfully collected those samples and you put them into orbit. Uh, so that's probably another two or four years after that. So we're probably looking at, you know, 10 or 12 years before those samples uh, come back uh, to Earth. Any plans on the uh, polar ice caps? Uh, for sample return, um, not examination. We, you know, we did have the Phoenix mission that landed very close to the polar on the edge of the polar cap, uh, you know, and that observed and um, measured ice and uh, presence of perchlorite. So we, we have had a polar mission. And of course, we do have orbiting missions there right now. Um, if you go to, uh, you know, um, uh, NASA eyes, uh, if you Google that, there is a app for the Mars missions that you can download and display and see all the activity at Mars. Um, so we still have uh, uh, Odyssey and um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter both have radar sounders and they've been sounding the northern uh, polar caps. Um, and I'll just mention there, there is actually a traffic jam of spacecraft going to Mars right now. Um, we have the United Arab Emirates that have a mission, you have the Chinese have a mission, and um, the Japanese have a mission. Uh, and you throw in the fact that we have perseverance going, and so uh, uh, we have to watch the uh, uh, traffic as we get to Mars because of all the activity that's there right now. Oh, oh and I forgot the Europeans, uh, five. So there are five missions this summer wow. to Mars. And who knows what it's going to be like two years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they'll have to check out the, the traffic app on uh, the conditions at Mars. Yeah, ways for Mars. <laughs> uh, there was a quick question from Jeff. He said he wanted to know that the vast extension of opportunities, productive life, significantly if shuffle astronomical careers. I'm sorry, shuttle astronomical uh, uh, no, 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 the. Did, did it shuffle people's career to move people, oh, change people's careers a lot? Well, um, I, the, the great experience we had was we allowed the next generation of uh, scientists and engineers to participate in this project. And that has sent their careers forward. Um, so we had uh, a lot of young people, um, undergraduates, grad students, postdocs, and eventually, you know, senior researchers move through the ranks um, uh, on this project. And so we were a, a magnificent, um, uh, uh, what's the baseball term for, uh, you know, a field team that you know, we were able to bring people forward, give them great experience on how to explore. And so many of those people are on um, the new mission. So it was, it was a really wonderful opportunity for early career hires um, to go forward, both in the engineering and scientific community. It makes sense. It makes sense. Like a farm team. We're moving, farm we're team. Through. That's the term I was looking for. Yes. Yeah. How much is known about China's Tianwen rover launched in July? And how does it compare to Perseverance? Or do we know? Um, I don't know. I've been frustrated by finding a, a, a you know, a dearth of information about that mission. Um, the few images I've seen of their design is that it's very similar looking to Spirit and Opportunity, you know, surprise, surprise. Um, and so we'll see, you know, they, they had some, you know, limited luck with their lunar exploration. Um, they faced some challenges there. Um, you know, Mars is, is not an easy place. You know, over half the missions that have gone to Mars have failed. Um, you know, in the United States, we've had our own set of failures, but uh, so far we've been successful in the, in the recent epoch. And uh, but it, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of great technical talent to make it all happen.
a lot of comments that there. Thank you for the presentation. What a wonderful oh, talk. Yeah. Your your excitement is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was great speaking with you all. I hope, I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. Um, so, um, Mark, if there are no further questions, then then perhaps I'll, I'll sign off. Uh, well, John, thank you so much, and we'd encourage you once uh, once we get on to Mars, we'd be glad to have you back and uh, tell us a little about a little bit about what's going on, what we find. Well, uh, actually, you know, my my career has moved on to exoplanets, so uh, oh. interested in hearing about exoplanets, and uh, maybe sometime in the future, I can come back and uh, share with you something about that. Well, that, then we can have you back a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate You're it. Welcome, much. everyone. Thanks very For much. Virtual applause. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going to take over as a presenter. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll turn my camera on if anyone wants to talk or uh, what's going on. I want to want to thank uh, John again for being here. It was a I, I found it very interesting about how how we proceeded from one mission to the next and it really gave he really gave a nice uh clear uh portrayal of why we did what we did going to mars uh, each each successive time taking the learnings from one mission bringing it on to the next and i thought it was very clear very cool cool comments for anyone 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 having a a a, a snack as we view this this evening No, the quiet group. Yeah, I had some dark chocolate and uh, some ginger tea. <laughs> it was actually nice yeah. sitting here with the screen, just sitting to relax. That's nice. It is nice. Are there DNA studies? I didn't catch that, uh, Bill. <clears throat> bourbon is a snack. Yes, bourbon is a snack. So is a beer. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I found it very interesting, starting with uh, Viking going all the way up to the present time. So it was, it was good stuff. It was good stuff. So is there many people that are planning to check out the site tomorrow? It gives us an opportunity to see each other in person, whether we're wearing masks or we can stay far enough away not to wear masks, whatever. It should, should be. Uh, I think it's going to be a nice day tomorrow. Valerie, how's, how's things in Oneonta? Are you able to uh, meet at all right now? Um, not exactly. So, you know, it was a, a great time for me to start a new job in Oneonta, let me tell you, with all of this COVID craziness. But they, they sent all of the students home last week, so there's pretty much nobody on campus right now. So it's, it's all virtual learning. Uh, it, there's got to be a ton of food left over at the uh, commissaries. <laughs> Yeah, there was a big issue with that. They actually ran out of food because there was conflict with whether or not they should have been serving food to the potentially sick kids. And it was a whole debacle a couple of weeks ago. So they ran out of food and then they had a surplus of food. And yeah, just <laughs> we need we need an hour and a couple of drinks to really share the whole stories of the last. That's couple amazing. Of weeks. But, That's amazing. Uh, the kids are troopers. I have to say that they're really pushing through, and all of my students show up for class willing to learn. So I have to give them credit. You know, That's my good. students are doing pretty good. That's good. That's good. Wow. And, and what a way to start out your your teaching career there. <laughs> right. It can only get better from here. So. That's right. That's right. It, it will get better from here. You know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck. Thank good you. Luck. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Andy's going to have breakfast now. Now that he's had his morning lecture, unless he's already had it. <laughs> it's a nice way to start the day. So when we get to the, I'm going to go to the site tomorrow. Uh, I'll probably be there about noon or so to get to, to help help Bob kick things off and uh, I'm gonna see where we're at with the uh, C14 if we're ready for a, uh, a star party there or try to be ready for a star party I'm thinking sometime in the next week I'll uh, I'll head up there I will try to see if I could stream and if I think we can stream we'll, we'll tr we, uh, we might try a, a, a short streaming episode otherwise I'd like to record 
planets because I think we could we could capture some nice planetary images with that scope, and that'll be a fun night to catch uh, potentially catch five planets uh, in one evening. And that would be a lot of fun to do, and maybe a comet as well. So we'll see how that works out to do a virtual star party there. That would be a fun one, an, an all solar system star party. That could be pretty entertaining. I'll let you know how, uh, how that works out. All right. Anything else, anybody? A lot going on. We got an open house tomorrow. We got a board meeting Wednesday. And if you want to, you want to attend, you can attend virtually. Let me know you want to come. I'll send you a link to that meeting. Uh, the following weekend, we'll have uh, members observing on uh, Saturday. Uh, and anytime we gather, we're going to be observing our COVID rules where we're uh, keeping our distance, wearing our masks, and bathrooms. You need to, uh, you need to self clean before and after. Uh, that should be fun. Uh, I am recording this, and once I hang up, I, it will stop recording, and I'll send a link out to everyone of this meeting uh, that's on the email list, and uh, you can watch this talk again if you wanted to get more information from it, or if you you came in late, uh, you can get uh, you can get the whole the whole talk and a little bit of the before stuff as well. So. With that, I have no chicken wings to look forward to, but I do have a beer in the fridge. All right. Clear skies, everyone. I hope to see some of you tomorrow over at the Ferris Center. If not, I'll see you next time we do a virtual star party or perhaps an observing. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.